Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, work on a new state budget is underway, and key lawmakers describe the spending agreements for higher education and for outdoor and cultural heritage. Plus, a look at one of the Capitol features you can once again visit in person. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. As lawmakers work to complete the state's next two-year budget, some budget areas are coming together. One that has been agreed to is funding for clean water, land, and legacy. Joining me is the chair of the Senate Legacy Committee, Senator Carrie Rood. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's exciting, isn't it, to see people and no masks and we're together in the studio. I think you said the first time. Yes, you are my oh. first in-studio guest in more than a year. Oh, I am honored to be the first guest. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with, with your committee funding for the next biennium. The money that funds the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Finance Bill comes to $645 million. Uh, it's the result of Minnesotans voting to raise taxes on themselves back in 2008. The amendment expires in 2034, so we're basically at the halfway point. How important has this funding been? Oh, it's really been uh, amazing. Uh, there's so many states across the, the United States that are so jealous of what Minnesota has done, and this, this has really moved us forward in the environment. Uh, we just celebrated the 10th anniversary. We had a big celebration before we couldn't have celebrations, and it was really wonderful. And I think one of the things that we really are focused on now is in 10 years or nine years, we're gonna have to prove to the uh, people in Minnesota that we did a good job spending their money. And so we have made some really, I think, great structural changes in the last couple of years um, to make sure that the money has gone exactly the way the voters voted for it, that we stick to the Constitution and what they wanted the money to, to go for. So that in 10 years we can say, look at the great job we did in spending the money the way you wanted it to. And so the programs we've instituted and, and how we're going forward, uh, we think is, is um, we're very proud of, of where we're going and, and where we've been, but we've learned a lot in the last 10 years about, um, we've done a lot of studies and now we wanna implement all those things, the boots on the ground um, kind of idea. So the money is divided up into four categories. One of those categories is, um, Trails and parks and trails, the Department of Natural Resources does receive a significant amount of this money. And the pandemic certainly prompted Minnesotans to get out and explore the natural beauty of the state. I read in the Albert Lee Tribune that there's a new partnership between public libraries and the Department of Natural Resources. So patrons can check out a parks pass and get out and hit those trails. What are some other examples of the parks and trails benefit of this amendment? You know, we look at, um, we want everyone to use our parks and trails. And some of our parks and trails are not really accessible for a certain population. Uh, they have trouble getting to the restrooms. The trails are maybe their um, dirt or their gravel and they can't use them. So part of what we do is make our parks accessible to everyone. So you can bring grandma to the park if she's in her wheelchair. Or you, if someone has a, a uh, disability that makes it difficult for them to get there. Uh, we want that to be an experience for everyone. So making the trails and the facilities accessible, has this amendment has really helped and focused on that. And so that's an amazing thing. And then making some of our um, uh, facilities, we want to use, uh, say, solar panels. We want to be very environmentally friendly in our parks. And so this amendment has really allowed us to do those extra things uh, that we needed to do, that we wanted to do, we just didn't have the ability to do. Um, the amendment dollars also fund uh, clean water, which to protect, enhance, and restore Minnesota's lakes, rivers, streams, and groundwater. What are some of the ways that the legacy money helps one of Minnesota's greatest assets? You know, we fund the soil and water conservation districts out of the clean water fund, and that's been kind of controversial, but for the last six years we have done that and I think that has made a tremendous uh, difference. Um, they, they are the boots on the ground that really implement all the clean water um, programs, whether it's a Bowser or MPCA or DNR, they really help implement them. They are willing to work with anyone uh, in their area 
We have the one watershed, uh, one water plan. They work with the farmers to make sure that the farmers are doing good soil health um, things. So that is um, the implementation of all these wonderful programs and the funding of the Soil and Water Conservation Districts is really an, um, an amazing uh, piece to this. Um, and one new program that I saw was in the final agreement is called River Watch. What is that? Oh, it's so fun. So we started out with a small group of um, kids and they, they monitor the river and they monitor the, they go out in there um, on the banks and they also go out in canoes and they monitor, they take water samples and they send it into the, um, the laboratories for analysis and they're really involved in watching clean water. And we have funded that for four years now, but we want to take it on the road and we think that just rather than having a small group of children in, in, uh, on the Red River, um, we want to bring it to, like, say, children on the Mississippi River so that they really are invested in what is clean water and what's coming down my river and what's next to me. And so it's really fun. So this, this year we're funding to expand the program to other areas, and we hope that we can bring it statewide um, to bring in a lot of children in the, in the next generation. Um, also, in the Clean, Clean Water Fund is money for the University of Minnesota to develop testing for chronic wasting disease in water. Now, chronic wasting disease affects our both farmed and wild deer. The prions stay in the environment permanently. What, what's the importance of this? What can you say about this? You know, this is something that we had not funded and it was not in our bill. But we have a crisis situation up in Beltrami County where we have a uh, farm that has a chronic wasting disease and now there's from that farm there's 10 other farms that are quarantined so we're kind of in a crisis situation and some of the deer um, were found um, the carcasses were found in the water in a stream that goes through this farm and so we need to know where those prions went because they are kind of indestructible and we are really excited that we are able to react to a current situation and fund this and we had um, Dr. Peter Larson from the University of Minnesota come and speak to us about how important this was. So we were really happy that we can include this funding right now when it's so critical. Um, also receiving funding is the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, which supports the State Arts Board, the Minnesota Historical Society, the Humanities Center. There's more. Tell us about a few more things that, that this branch of funding supports. You know, one of the things that we've done structurally that I'm really proud of is we decided that the, the state legislature should not pick winners and losers. And so we have made funds, um, say cultural heritage, and we put in language that says all Minnesotans can be, apply for these funds. And the Humanities Center um, has worked um, really hard with us to make sure the language is exactly how it should be so every Minnesotan can apply for these funds for their culture, their heritage, regardless of what it is. And then we also have um, uh, the children's museums. We have a plethora of children's museums. They're so important across the state. And so we did the same thing. We made a pool of money. They can all apply. It makes sure that the funds are used correctly, not for operating expenses, but for great new exhibits for them. Um, we did the same thing with the veterans memorials, because there's a lot of small towns who they love their veterans, they have memorials, and they, um, they need just maybe a little help to get them over the, the edge to get that memorial finished and done. And so we've made a pool of money for them that they can apply for. So instead of individual legislators picking winners and losers and groups and what they can do, they can apply through this uh, grant program through the Humanities Society. And then we think it's really fiscally responsible because if maybe they don't have the ability to administer the grant, um, the Humanities Society can help them to do that, that the money is accounted for and used properly. So we're excited and we think that in 10 years we can say, gosh, look at what we've done and what we've accomplished. One last question. Uh, the Outdoor Heritage Fund is the fourth category. It's funded on an annual basis. Recommendations come from a 12-member council called the Lassard Sams Outdoor Heritage Council. This year, the legislature is funding their, all of their recommendations. How effective is this council? Uh, they are amazingly effective, and that's why the Senate really fought for the last uh, uh, three bienniums to make sure that we take their recommendations and we don't change their recommendations. I see um, Senator Lang in our caucus. He walks around with this huge 
three ring binder and they vet every project and they um, rank them on how ready they are and, and the importance of their project and they meet they have I think they're actually meeting today to start the next funding uh, process so they do an amazing job there's a citizens group and a legislative group and they work together hand in hand to come up with this great proposals and they are all really well um, vetted nonpartisan um, and their staff is excellent Mark Johnson does a great job so I I can't speak more highly for that group and what they accomplish. Senator Kerry Rood, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's been fun and I'm so honored to be the first. <laughs> thank you. On the opening day of the special session, Senate leaders spoke to the media about the importance of completing the state budget before July 1st. I think you can see from the Senate perspective, both Republicans and Democrats were ready to roll up our sleeves to get the job done. I think that's important for Minnesota. The, the fact is, if we did not get by, done by July 1, the ramifications are too serious for Minnesota. Uh, the courts ruled in 2017 that they no longer will step in, which means virtually everything would not be Funded, so that's your corrections, uh, uh, long-term care facilities, any place that requires a, or that would get state dollars suddenly gets none. And so it's very, very serious this time. Before that, it was about 80% of the uh, of, of everything got funded. And so we're going to get done. It's, it's, it's not easy. Most everything is together. There are a few things that have a few loose ends, but it is absolutely coming together. The speaker, myself, and the governor, uh, we're going to get it done. We have a state surplus, we have federal funds, people have been working hard on these negotiations. It sounds like we're making progress. Um, we need to do our jobs. And um, as I said, you know, we should do them sooner rather than later because we know that this just costs more to the Minnesota taxpayers the later we get towards June 30th. As the deadline for enacting a new state budget approaches, the budget agreement for higher education has been finalized. Chair of the Senate Higher Education Committee, Senator David Tomasoni, joined me this week to highlight some of the proposals in the funding package. Your working group conducted itself like good college students and finished your work almost on time. The higher education budget was one of the first to come in with an agreement for the next two years. Are you satisfied that this agreement is a good compromise? I'm assuming you're saying almost on time because it wasn't done by, by May 17th. Correct. But we actually uh, were given a date of May 28th to get our agreement done and we were done on May 25th. So so we had we had a really, really good, and, and you know, um, I'm not even sure compromise is the right word. I, I think it's a really good solution. Uh, I think we came up with a good bill. We worked together on it. And I think the people who are affected by this bill are, are, are satisfied that we came up with a really, really good product. Um, one of the things that, that I heard in a working group meeting that there was some dissatisfaction with was the parity issue between the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota state systems. Um, those Funding for those institutions is a huge part of the budget. 45% goes to Minnesota State, 40% to the University of Minnesota. But if what they asked the legislature for, Minnesota State is only getting about half, whereas the University of Minnesota is getting about 82%. So there's a parity thing in terms of the amount of funding coming from the state. Is that fair? Well, I don't, you know, if, you, if you're going to use percentages, it's one thing. But... Uh, the Minnesota State asked for about 77 and a half million, and they got about 56 and a half. Uh, and and uh, Minnesota asked for, University of Minnesota asked for uh, 46 and a half, and they got 38. And, and uh, the issue becomes what our target was, number one, and our target was 100 million. If we were going to satisfy both of those requests, plus add, add in, the needs of the Office of Higher Education and some of the other uh, funding things that we have in the bill. We didn't need it about 130 million. So we couldn't get there. And quite frankly, the bill is extremely fair from the standpoint that Minnesota State received a real lot of um, CARES money 
from the federal government as a result of the COVID-19. And in fact, most of their expenses are spoken for and taken care of as a result of what they lost during COVID. Whereas the University of Minnesota didn't get all, all, all the money uh, refunded. And so I think when you take a look at all the factors, you'll find that uh, we came up with a very well-balanced bill. Governor Walls sought and received funding for a new program called Direct Admissions Minnesota. What is this new program and what is its intent? I think it's pretty neat, actually. You know, um, so high school kids have to make a, a decision when they become seniors about where they're going to apply to for, for schools, which college they're going to go to. Um, and they actually have to put in applications. What this does is actually identifies students who would be accepted if they were, were to apply and then basically notifies them that you are accepted in this system, pick a place where you want to go. And it makes it much easier and, and it actually turns the um, admissions process for our high school seniors into something that is much easier and more streamlined for both, both the kids and the parents. So a student um, particularly uh, maybe students of color or students from educationally underserved areas would get this letter saying, hey, you've done well enough in high school, you can come to college here and, and prompt that the beginning of that process uh, in case they weren't aware that they had that option. Is that kind of the idea? The, the idea is, is, is to serve all the students. But yes, your, your specific example is a very good one because uh, oftentimes, uh, people in disadvantaged situations don't actually ha have the ability to access some of the things that other students do. And so it's, it's really, really a good thing. Uh, another effort is going to improve educational opportunities for people of color with a scholarship pilot program for the training of teachers of color. And we've heard a lot about this at the legislature, about there not being enough teachers of color. There's also an increase in grant funding for upper, underrepresented teacher candidates. Why are these efforts important? We hear uh, about how it is for a student of color to being in a, in a classroom situation and being taught by a white person, for example, and what a difference it makes if there's somebody in front of the class that is looks like them and acts like them and knows what their background is like. And we have heard that it makes a big, big difference for, for students of color who basically haven't had the opportunity to be taught by somebody of color. And so these things are attempts to make sure that everybody gets equal access. And it's, an, it's another indication of how good the bill is. Uh, another, yet another new program is the Fostering Independence Higher Education Grants. Uh, what are these? So we have a real lot of st statistics about foster kids and how they uh, fare when they're in college and, and whether or not they finish college. And so, uh, and, and the, these st statistics are, are, are pretty grim actually. And, and so uh, this program, what it does is it says, if you're a foster kid and you're going to college or you've been accepted to college, this program will fill the gap between a, a, any money that they're getting to go to college and make the, make the gap full so that they get free college. And it was with the incentive that your college is paid for. So finish college and, and get out there into society and become a a productive citizen because because some of these uh, statistics are really, really ugly. So if you're a foster kid in Minnesota, you can have the chance for free college. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and the program as it is designed um, identifies a certain number of foster kids that are already going to, going to school and then uh, supplements the gap for them. Um, the Hunger Free Campus program has been around for a while, but until now, it was limited to Minnesota community and technical colleges. Um, it will be expanded to include all post public post-secondary institutions, nonprofit private colleges, and tribal colleges. How does this program work? Why is it important? How important is 
having reliable food for college students? Food insecurity is one of the things that we just heard from the students all the time. We have um, upwards of 37 to 40 percent of our kids on college campuses who aren't eating right. And this program just is goes a long way to make sure that there's there's nutrition on campus for the kids that aren't able to access it. I'm pretty sure that in some instances, what actually ends up happening is that because they need food, they have to make a decision. Do I drop out of college and eat or do I stay in college and, and stay hungry? And well, the answer is not what we want to have. And so um, uh, this, this program helps them in real life instances. And finally, before we go, another um, factor of increasing concern among college students is their mental health. The University of Minnesota's College Student Health Survey reported unmanaged stress for 41.5% of students, up from about 27% a decade ago. What is going to help college students with their mental health? Well, they, they need services, and that's, that's what the bill uh, attempts to provide. And um, we heard mental health over and over and over again. And then with COVID, it just became worse and worse and worse. And so uh, I said, you know, this is one of those kind of things that people need to realize that mental health is as important as physical health. And if you don't have mental health on these campuses, these kids aren't going to go to school and uh, maybe won't graduate and oftentimes get into worse trouble. So we, we provided for, for that in, in, in this uh, bill also. So I think we, we, we ran the gamut of trying to figure out how to make college more affordable. Uh, we made uh, institutions uh, able to fund their needs, uh, whether it be um, uh, paying for the instructors or putting in new, new types of services or, or instructional uh, capability for them. And, um, and, we, and we, we increase the amount of aid that there is that, that's in the bill for the state grant program. So uh, I, I think given the limited resources we had, uh, we came up with a really, really good product. Senator David Tomasoni, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks for, for having me. After a closure spanning 440 days, the Minnesota State Capitol has reopened to the public. Here's a preview of one of the many historical spaces you can once again visit in person. The State Capitol Rathskeller is sort of a time capsule from 1905 when the building was built. What is the history of this impressive basement room? Yeah, this is a really significant part of Cass Gilbert's envision or visioning of these spaces. And it's uh, unique because it's a German Rathskeller, so it's patterned after something you would find in a German public hall. The tradition is they debate upstairs and then at the end of the day they come down and have a few drinks, talk to each other, so there's a camaraderie and a fellowship. So it's kind of a day, a place to unwind after a busy day. So there's that, you know, the German immigration, that was our largest immigration group, has been throughout our history of a state. And so that is a nice nod to the German heritage, but also to kind of impart that uh, tradition of a German public space and a place to gather uh, below ground. The combination of anti-German sentiment and prohibition had a big effect on the Rathskeller. What happened? That really was a, a key event in how you would have seen this building and this space in particular after the World War I began. So it was kind of a double whammy, a, a two-edged sword for the Rathskeller because it has a lot of uh, drinking slogans written in German. So now we're fighting a war against Germany. Plus there was a lot of strong prohibition forces. So you have German drinking slogans, which is not a good combination for what people saw as a, a place to bring the public down to or be a part of that uh, establishment. So this entire ceiling, all the walls were whitewashed. Everything was painted white. And that was the tradition for uh, many, many years. There was a time in the 30s when Governor Theodore Christensen painted some of the slogans back in. 
and then we're not sure why that got covered up again a few years after that. And it wasn't until we did the restoration of the space in 1999 that we brought back all the original stencils, all the drinking slogans again, to give you a sense of what it would have appeared like in 1905. How extensive was the research that needed to be done to bring it back to its original intent? Yeah, we, we did a lot of research just to understand the space a lot more. Um, that's where we never really found any evidence to say that this was you know, a governor's edict because of the war, World War I. Most of the uh, documentation we see with letters to the governor, women's auxiliary groups, was to, to kind of advocate for the prohibition, to remove the drinking slogans. But it, it's a combination of both. I think we can uh, understand that's kind of the sentiment of America at that time. Why should visitors to the Capitol come see the Rathskeller? Well, as I said before, it's a really neat space. It's uh, something you don't necessarily expect to see in the state capitol. And uh, once again, since it's been restored, 1999, it opened, reopened in 2000. It's a full service, you know, cafeteria again, so you can during eat the here. Legislative during, session. during the legislative session, you can come down here and eat. And then it's also just a, a beautiful place to see that decoration. And uh, it's. It's a combination of an American rascal and a German rascal because you have traditionally in a rascal in Germany you might have German eagles. Well, here we have eagles that are American eagles instead of a German eagle. And then you also have two dates that are important parts of our state's history, 1849, which is the year we became a territory, 1858 we became the 32nd state. So those uh, dates were part of that original stencil. And so, there's insets as you as you walk through and see this restored space we were able to preserve some of the original stencil and so that's inset against the wall and there's a new layer of plaster on, on on the edges of that or above that that has a new stencil but throughout the space you can see these really neat uh, examples of what it looked like in 1905. The public is welcome to come down here. We have a nice little exhibit that Minnesota Historical Society put together a little display to explain a little bit more of the history and you can see you know, some of what happened to this space. And, and you also discover there are 22 layers of paint on top of the original art. So there was a lot of overpainting and painting of the ceiling over time. And since the renovation in 2017, there is uh, overflow space now by the governor's dining room and the judicial dining room. Is that, is that right? Yeah, there, there's additional eating space, and, and that's really a nice addition to the public as, access and usability of this space. Uh, this is a, can be a noisy space when there's a lot of people here. It's a neat historic space to have lunch, but also if you want a little bit more quieter conversation or overflow, there's a, a kind of an adjunct space down the hallway that's another neat space with reproductions of the furniture that was there, the tables and the chairs, some television, so if you want to watch the committees or the session, you can kind of keep up to date with that. So as part of the restoration project, it's a really important part of what we do here and how the public can use the spaces. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.